Very nice. All right. Well, I think we are going to go ahead and get started. It looks like everyone is back with us. And I'm just going to bring up a PowerPoint. So first and foremost, welcome everyone today. We are so happy to have you here with us. And um, I also thank you for your patience on us using Zoom meeting as opposed to Zoom webinar. Typically, we would, people would use a webinar venue because it um, has more security measures. Um, but the reason we didn't do it is because this event is always about bringing together all of our alums and our existing classes with the supervisors. And you know, it's more important than ever that we as leaders really stick together and support one another. So we wanted to have the time so you could actually see one another and spend a little time chatting with one another. So it may be a little imperfect. In fact, I think we could have ended up with a bandwidth with glitch or something this morning, trying to get everybody, all the gold sponsors in their breakout room. So if it didn't work for your group quite as expected, we're sorry about that. We tested this six ways to Sunday and we're trying to make it work. So I hope you had a good time with each other while you were in the room and welcome to all of you. And really what's uh, fascinating, so this is our 30th Board of Supervisors breakfast and our first virtual Zoom breakfast. I, for one, hope that it is our last Zoom, but we're so lucky to have this technology. I just miss seeing you all in person and having that time to really, um, you know, get to know one another, have virtual hugs or elbow taps or something like that. But the reason we're doing this is because we heard from you, our alums, that you wanted to hear from our leadership, our elected leaders. So instead of waiting until things opened up where we could do this in person, we thought it was really important to make this happen now. So I wanna do a big shout out to the small but mighty staff of Leadership Fairfax, who probably thought I was nuts when three weeks ago I said, we're gonna do this. And to our, our volunteers and our contractors who stepped up to help us do this, Casey, Colin, Susan Sims, Laurie, Andy, Thank you so much for that. And then especially to our supervisors. We know you have your hands full right now. And so we have all the supervisors with us right now. We are going to lose two of them shortly. Supervisor Gross and Supervisor Walkinshaw both have um, previous commitments. And so they're gonna have to leave us, but they were kind enough to come on early and spend time with, with some folks in a private room. So for that, we really, appreciate that and thank you for all the work that you're doing on behalf of the folks in um, Fairfax County. We so appreciate that. You know, it's interesting. We had a theme all planned for this year and it was all about the future. You know, it's 2020. It was going to be a Fairfax odyssey and you as supervisors would have seen yourself in spacesuits and, you know, a lot of playful stuff. But the world has certainly changed. And we had planned to have this in, um, in April, early April. And as we all know, March threw us a big curve with the coronavirus hitting and COVID-19 taking over. And the challenges have just continued to mount since then. <clears throat> but you know, these challenges, when we think about COVID-19, having to quarantine, having to make sure that our hospital systems are prepared, our school systems, all of that could handle what we were being faced with. That was a huge undertaking that took incredible leadership. We also have Dr. Braybrand with us today from Fairfax County Schools, so thank you for that. And we also have the Fairfax County Executive Brian Hill on the line with us. But you'll be hearing from the supervisors individually, and they'll be talking about the response to COVID, but they'll also be talking about what has been more recent in the press, on our minds, and on our hearts. And that's after the killing of Black citizens at the hands of police, and then all of the protests, the conversations that are starting to take place are so critically important for us as leaders to embrace and embrace in a way that we can make 
lasting change. I know that Supervisor McKay will address these issues in just a few minutes, but for those of you that aren't aware, I just wanted to mention that about five years ago, we realized as an organization that even though we were really built on diversity in bringing people from diverse backgrounds, different races, nationalities, gender, different thought perspectives, and different sectors of our community, we realized that the inequities that existed in Fairfax County were needed to be addressed. So we adopted a social and racial equity lens for all of the programs that we do. So all of our training includes that work. And we train our folks now on how to have conversations around these issues. We have a lot of work to be done. But if we look at these challenges as opportunities, I know that we have the ability to step up and help these and make, make lasting change. And you know, it really hit me this week when I was reading um, the obit for a woman, Dr. Sylvia Munday. So Dr. Munday has a whole lot of firsts to her credit. She was in our inaugural class of Leadership Fairfax. She was one of our first chairs of the board. She is an African-American woman. She, what are some of our other firsts? She was, she actually spent most of her life or a big part of her life as an educator, but how I got to know her was as an entrepreneur. She was the first female franchisee for Popeye's Chicken and she had her store in Reston. She was the first female president of an Optimist Club and she was the first black female director of the then Fairfax Chamber of Commerce. So why do I bring this up now? I bring this up now because she was a trailblazer as were so many and are so many of our alums right now and is a black female in the 80s. She was brave enough and assertive enough to really stand for what was right. And it's especially poignant now because she died from COVID. So we um, send our condolences out to the family. Her daughter, Tracy, is on the call today. So Tracy, our sympathies and prayers are with your family. So I think we all have the opportunity to, to channel some Sylvia Monday today and into the future so that we can strengthen our community. So at this point, I'd like to turn the stage over to Monica Schmoody who is the Mid-Atlantic president for Cigna. Monica? You're on. There I am. I just unmuted myself. Karen, can you hear me okay? Yep, you're good. Oh, wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Karen. Um, as, she, as Karen mentioned, I'm Monica Schmoody. I'm market president for Cigna Mid-Atlantic. It's really a pleasure to be with you at any time, but especially virtually today. Cigna is a proud sponsor of this event, and we partner with Leadership Fairfax and their important work throughout the community. Karen, I, I enjoyed hearing you talk about the importance of hosting this meeting, and thank you to you and, and your staff for everything that you've done to make this happen very quickly. As a committed member of Fairfax County and at Cigna, we strongly believe it's our responsibility to serve as a leader in health improvement and beyond. Improving health is at the heart of everything that we do. Now, last year, I remember greeting this group in a, in a large ballroom. Um, of course, we had stage and podium. There were baseballs, uh, mock baseballs, right, flying around, and it was so much fun. And I put the challenge out to each one of you, and if you were there, you may remember this. We talked about healthcare, the importance of having a physician relationship, and I said, take care of yourself. I reminded you to invest in your own health and make that a priority. And I said, we're counting on each and every one of you because we need your leadership in this region. And if you're there and you remembered it, you may have taken that seriously and formulated that relationship with a physician and, and made your health a priority as requested. So here we are, flash forward to this year, and health is just on such a stage. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the situation we find ourselves in today. I'm, I'm excited that we're focusing on today's event um, with a the theme of looking to the future because battling coronavirus is unprecedented in our country's modern medical history. But we have really, we've known that it's been 24 seven for us here at Cigna and I know here in the community. 
as we learn more every day, the flow of information and misinformation can be overwhelming for all of us. Uh, but also emerging every day are a number of bright spots. Karen, you called out a few of those this morning. It was, it's, it's great and that's, that's what I cling on to every day and maybe you all do as leaders as well. Um, so I'm gonna start with a few of those bright spots and, and I'm gonna start with what the data is telling us today from Fairfax County. So our infection rate, the R0 infection rate is steadily decreasing. And if you follow the data on this, if you're kind of a data nerd, I'm a little bit here and others um, on, the, on the meeting might be too. Um, that number should be below 0.9 uh, for over two weeks to have confidence that the spread of the virus is under control. So we're seeing a steady decrease, which is really good news. I like good news. The next piece of good news I'll share with you today is around, we've heard a lot about ICU headroom and those on the call from healthcare in the, in the market know that this is something that we've really kept an eye on. So we're an improved headroom with ICUs at 81% right now, which means there's 19% capacity of ICU beds in our region. Um, and that's down from where it, it previously was at only 3%, um, which is a capacity we get very, very concerned about. The other bright spot I'll point out in healthcare is around technology. And so as we've you know, focused on technology here this morning, uh, coming together virtually, healthcare has also really taken um, technology and used it to our advantage. We've seen the adoption of telemedicine or virtual health visits shift into hyperdrive over the past couple of weeks and months. And now as an industry, we're on pace to top 1 billion virtual visits by the end of the year which is absolutely tremendous and it's very exciting. Other bright spots that I'll point to are exam examples, um, and you can all think of them right now as they play out in your own life, your own community, your own business. Examples of people coming together in extraordinary ways to help in any way that they can, uh, including through unprecedented collaboration of healthcare organizations and leaders like you all, the government, the private sector working together for the greater good. It's just, it's very motivating and it's inspiring. And as I look at this from, from the leader of Cigna in the Mid-Atlantic, I noticed that we're doing more than standing with people. And I know you are as well. We're not just standing with people and businesses and partners and communities that we serve. We're actually running to them. We're taking action in any way that we can. And we're, we're thinking about creative ways to do that. The strength of the human spirit during these challenging times has really been extraordinary. And maybe you're like me and you find it quite humbling. So just as Karen mentioned, um, and, and Cigna agrees that transforming healthcare is in our DNA, but so is inclusion, equity, and diversity. Karen, I share your concern that my heart has been really heavy over the past couple of weeks with the unrest collectively happening around us. But as you mentioned, I know together we can drive action. Together, we can bring stakeholders into a place where we can make a difference on critical topics. It's meetings like today, where that all begins or that continues. Every one of us has an opportunity to continue setting the right example by just upholding our values. It's how we serve in our communities, how we interact with each other. And it's more important than ever that we move forward as a country, as a region, as a community, act with compassion and also act with empathy. Because the more we understand each other, the more we'll treat each other with dignity and respect. And therefore the stronger our community will be. It's really the primary reason that we choose to partner with Leadership Fairfax because you are an organization that's dedicated to bringing together leaders who are equipped to amplify community engagement. It's what we need now. You, uh, you always talk about expanding awareness of local challenges and you turn your visions into a brighter future, not just for some people, but you do it for all. We're really proud of that partnership. So there's a variety of reasons that bring us together today. I was joking that it's, it's, uh, it's wet out there in Northern Virginia, so I'm kind of happy not to be driving on the Beltway to the event, but we come together because we have one common discovery. We know that collectively we are invested in positive change. It's an investment where we know that our leadership does matter. I've seen it happen, you've seen it happen, where a good idea, large or small, can really change the lives of many. And I'm so motivated by what I've already heard this morning and I look forward to the additional comments throughout the next hour. So finally, I just wanna thank Leadership Fairfax for hosting this event. You pivoted Karen and team and, and you did a tremendous job. We're really proud to be aligned with you and uh, making our community healthier. What you do is really inspiring and we're proud to play a role in that. 
So now I'll pivot and I'll go to my uh, responsibilities to introduce Chairman Jeff McKay uh, for the county address. Let me tell you a little bit about Jeff for those of you not aware. Jeff was born and raised on the historic Route 1 corridor and prior to becoming chair, he served as a lead district supervisor. Jeff was elected chairman of the county board of supervisors in November of 2019. He had an ambitious agenda as well as he was on his way to putting the pieces of the puzzle into place following his landslide victory. And then came March. And having spent his entire professional career working on behalf of our county and its residents, we couldn't think of a better equipped person to lead us during these turbulent times. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your chairman, Jeff McKay. Thank you uh, very much, Monica, and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see a lot of faces on here that I haven't seen in a while and, and to get a good refresher on uh, our Fairfax County community uh, and how strong our community is. And, and looking at all of you, uh, it's, it's clear that uh, we can confirm that. Uh, let me just start by saying uh, things are real boring. Uh, there's not a lot going on. I think my colleagues on the board are looking for, for things to do uh, to fill their day. Uh, so we appreciate uh, you, you having us. Um, so I guess maybe we should talk about the uh, snapping alligator turtle, uh, 60 plus pound snapping alligator turtle that we found in the county recently. Um, but I, I say all that because I think we, we all need to start uh, our days, at least I do, uh, with an ability to laugh at something. Uh, and to enjoy life because frankly, uh, as many others have said already, uh, these are very trying times uh, for everybody in our community. And if we are going to uh, maintain our own physical, mental, uh, intellectual health, uh, I think having a laugh and seeing friends and smiling about things every once in a while uh, is a really important thing for, for all of us to do. Um, and I have a lot to smile about today. I uh, have a great uh, board of supervisors and tremendous colleagues uh, who love this county. Uh, we are celebrating today uh, an award for Joe Mondoro, who those of you who know Joe uh, know that he's a legend uh, in Fairfax County and a real uh, true community asset uh, for all of us. And uh, we have a very strong uh, community. And so as I remind people all the time, in difficult times, there's probably no better place in this world to weather a storm than Fairfax County because of the assets and the people and the resources that, that we have here. And so um, those things make me smile. Um, but clearly, uh, we have real challenges uh, have been acknowledged. Uh, first, we're, we're really living uh, right now in a world of, of two crises, uh, clearly the pandemic uh, and clearly a crisis of understanding systemic racism uh, being challenged with what does it mean uh, to have a police department. Uh, those things are, are not easy questions to answer. Uh, there's not one single policy solution uh, to all of those. Uh, and they challenge us every day right now. And frankly, um, trying to grapple with and juggle both of those uh, at the same time uh, is a challenge, but also a real opportunity. Uh, because I do think that folks, uh, particularly people of color, um, are suffering in ways that none of us, uh, most of us, cannot fully understand. Um, the backdrop of the police issues was we were living in a pandemic. And what did this pandemic show? This pandemic showed that we still have disproportionality uh, throughout our community. And when you look at the positive infections, uh, and the demographics of those individuals. Uh, it's clear that this is uh, a major pandemic that is affecting our elderly and affecting our people of color in disproportional ways. And we have to sit back and think about why is that, uh, particularly for people of color, why is that and what can we do about it? And uh, when I reflect on that and I reflect on the police incidents of, of recent, um, I keep coming back to our one Fairfax policy. And I said earlier, there's not one policy that can solve all of these problems, but there is a really important framework uh, that we recognize in Fairfax County. And that framework is similar to what Karen was speaking about earlier, is that we will look at all things we do in this county through a racial and equity social justice lens. And we will make sure that the decisions we make um, are lifting up all corners of the county. 
You know, when I decided to run for chairman, one of the major reasons was, is I have known uh, from where I have grown up in the district that I have represented uh, before being chairman, that there are absolutely parts of this county that have not been lifted up in the same way other parts of this county have surged forward. And we need to tackle that and grapple with that and be realistic about it. Uh, and one Fairfax is an attempt um, and a very strong one to not only make sure that we are looking at those systemic issues uh, through an equity lens, but in ultimate, you know, if you, if you think about the outcome of one Fairfax, you would hope that all corners of the county can thrive because we will be able to put in systems that help people overcome the challenges that have existed in some of our communities in Fairfax County for many, many decades. And so while these are trying times, it is through trying times that I think we can um, emerge with real success. And I think our community uh, wants that. I know our community wants that and I know our board does. And so uh, let me just talk about a few things. Uh, first, uh, COVID-19 obviously um, has changed our world. And I wanna give a shout out to uh, my colleagues on the Board of Supervisors because uh, some of them are new. Uh, some of them are seasoned veterans, but the way in which our board has pivoted to online meetings, uh, the way in which our staff uh, at the county has pivoted to keep our county open and operational throughout this pandemic, the way we have responded to infuse money into our nonprofits to help our most vulnerable, the way we have lobbied and pushed and prodded our federal government and our state government to get us testing resources and PPE. Uh, into our communities, the way we have infused $25 million into our small business community uh, through our RISE grant program to help our small business community through these challenges. Um, every step of the way, uh, we have been taking forward thinking action to try to help us all uh, get through this pandemic. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, things are looking up right now. You know, I, when, when the governor announced his six criteria for reopening the economy, uh, when that announcement was made, Northern Virginia and Fairfax County met zero of the six criteria for reopening. And because we were smart about the way in which we phased into that, we're sitting here today now in phase two, looking forward and we're meeting at least five, uh, some days six of the six criteria uh, as we emerge into future phases of reopening of our economy. And that's a tribute to looking at the data, uh, understanding it, uh, being realistic with our community about where we stand, and frankly, having a population in Fairfax County that has taken this seriously and is doing the right proper precautions and taking the right steps uh, to try to keep us all healthy. And, and that is definitely um, a positive on the pandemic as we move forward. Uh, we do know that there's some long-term sustained economic challenges uh, as well uh, as the demographic challenges that this pandemic has shown us. And we know that as we move forward, we still have a lot of tough days ahead. Uh, we're working closely with the EDA to make sure that as a county, uh, we can emerge economically from this faster than anywhere else in the country. Uh, and I'm confident that we will. Uh, we will put tools in place to help our businesses uh, get back to normal. Uh, as quickly as we can, but um, there have been a lot of positive stories in this as well. The way that our business community has come together uh, to help our frontline workers uh, has been tremendous. The way that our nonprofits are out there working every single day to put meals uh, in, in family homes and to help individuals with bills and to protect them from evictions. Um, these are all things that show the real uh, moral compass of this county and the real concern that all of us have for our neighbors. And, and that is something that no matter how bad this pandemic is, uh, we should feel good about as a county, that we have that network of people and that we have that moral compass that says, in times, tough times like this, we're gonna do everything we can uh, to help our neighbors get through this. And, and that's something we should be proud of. Um, when we look at the police issues and the race issues that are happening uh, in our country right now, um, Fairfax County uh, clearly uh, celebrates its diversity. It's why we're successful. Uh, but we clearly understand that like the rest of the country, we have work to do. Uh, we have work to do in how we do policing. Uh, we have work to do in building up all people in our community. 
we have work to do in ensuring transparency. Uh, and I know this board is committed to having the hard conversations in this community, hard but necessary conversations to move our community forward. And, and there are several of those that have already happened. Several groups have stepped forward in this county to bring about change. Uh, I've been to some of the rallies that have happened in the county, and I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm real proud of our community that in a peaceful way, uh, they have come out onto the streets as neighbors, uh, locking arms and saying, we need to do things better. Uh, and, and we know that we have a lot of systems in place that work well in the county. Uh, but we also know that we had an incident uh, right here in our own backyard um, that made all of us uh, take a hard look at, you know, how could something like that happen in Fairfax County? And we will continue to work closely with our police and with our community uh, to make sure that we have officers in uniform uh, who are there for the right reason, uh, who understand that they have been given uh, and have taken an oath of office and have been given a responsibility that's far more serious than most people will ever have. And how they act with that is something that we are going to continue to monitor and to, to make changes to. Uh, to make sure that things like we saw happen in Mount Vernon uh, a few weeks ago um, are not uh, illustrative of the type of police department that we have and the type of first responders that we have in this county. We, we, we are so disgusted by it in part because we know that our folks are held to a much higher standard than what we saw. They're better trained, they're better equipped. Uh, than most in the country and we will not accept anything less than that uh, as, as we move forward. And that community trust is such a vital part of, of, a, of a strong economy and, and a strong community. And so we, we are gonna keep uh, at that. Um, I have announced a chairman's task force on equity and opportunity. Uh, some of the people in this event today are gonna be on it. Um, and this is not to examine specifically the police issue, but it really is to take this one Fairfax notion and say, look, a lot of folks have been skeptical. Um, you know, when, when um, Supervisor Hudgens and I, who were the co-authors of the One Fairfax Resolution many years ago, uh, were going through the process, there were a lot of skeptics out there uh, in our community, uh, on our board, uh, other places. And I think what we've seen with this pandemic, I think what we've seen with this issue of policing, uh, if anything, uh, this is a complete and total confirmation of the need for us to think about race and equity and justice in every decision that we make uh, as we move forward. And this task force is gonna look at ensuring that not only have we implemented one Fairfax, but how do we take it to the next level? How, how do we make sure that our metrics in Fairfax County support uh, the notion and the pledge that we and our school board uh, together have made to, to support one Fairfax, not just as a proclamation, but as a policy. How are we making sure that the elements of it are not just being talked about, but are being implemented? And that's really what this task force is gonna look at is a long uh, systemic uh, issues that so many uh, people in our community still face and need our help to make sure that we can do better as we move forward. Uh, and when we all do better, we all do better. And, and we need to make sure that that is what we stand for in this county. Uh, we have, as you all know, a tremendous reputation, not just in the region, but in the country, as being a forward-thinking, well-organized, well-managed county. And we're being tested right now in a way that we've never been tested before. Uh, and I know we will succeed because the, the, the foundations that we support uh, are so strong. Um, and while we have issues and, and things that have to be adjusted foundationally, uh, we're in such a good place. And, and I want to always close on a positive note, because as I started this, I said I'm blessed with um, a great board of supervisors uh, who love this community. Uh, we're also blessed with a business community and nonprofit support structure uh, stronger than anywhere else in the country. Um, and we, we need to think about that every day. As we watch the national news, uh, suffering and struggling, uh, are happening in the United States in an unprecedented way. And I'm always happy when at the end of the day, I pull in my own driveway in Fairfax County and say, you know, thank goodness we live here where we are ahead 
on most of these issues and we have the support uh, to get through them successfully. And it really uh, helps us to keep our sanity uh, here as a board um, each and every day to know that we have that, sh that strength of community behind the decisions that we're making and that support. And it makes tackling the tough issues a, a lot easier. And so I thank uh, Leadership Fairfax for being a part of that dialogue. Uh, so many people here at this event today that play real, meaningful, important roles in making sure that we advance Fairfax County and making sure that we take care of uh, our most vulnerable. Um, the spirit of volunteerism uh, that we have in this county is stronger than ever. Uh, people in this county have volunteered over 22,000 hours um, since the declaration of the emergency began. And we keep a good track of that because we know that without all people pitching in to help us through this, it's going to be that much more difficult. So channel your anger, uh, channel your um, challenges into action, uh, helping us get through this as a community. And, and if you do that, uh, alongside our board, uh, we will have a uh, successful uh, closeout to these issues and a much, much better future for us moving forward. Um, lastly, I want to mention that um, while we were going through COVID and talking about disproportionality, um, I've had many conversations with our uh, leaders at the federal and state level, including with the governor, uh, stressing to him the importance of why Northern Virginia is very different than the rest of the state, demographically, economically, um, and the governor has acknowledged that. Um, I'm happy to say he's coming to Fairfax County today. Uh, for his press conference this afternoon. And before his press conference, we're sitting down uh, in a roundtable conversation with leaders in our Hispanic community to talk very clearly with the state about the disproportionality issues of COVID-19 uh, so that we can get more state resources and testing, uh, especially in our vulnerable community and our workforce that we know need and want to get back to work, but have to do it safely. And so the governor is coming to Fairfax today for that press conference. And uh, we're grateful for that because we need the resources of the state uh, as we move forward. And lastly, I know the superintendent uh, is with us today and, and I wanna reassure everyone that our board is keenly aware uh, of the importance of safely doing everything we can to get our schools back open this fall. Uh, critical to um, our economy, but also critical to, we know disproportionality in learning in schools. And the children who face the biggest struggles are the ones who lose the most uh, when our schools are closed. And so I will commit uh, to everyone on this uh, call that our board is ready and willing to do everything we can, resource-wise, talent-wise, uh, logistics-wise, uh, to help our schools get reopened this fall. Um, it is absolutely uh, probably, if, if not one of our number one uh, challenges right now, it's right up there and we are all working together uh, to make sure that that happens. And so uh, congratulations again to Joe Mondoro. Congratulations to uh, Leadership Fairfax for putting together what uh, is always a great event today. Look forward to the questions and the state of Fairfax while challenged right now is inherently strong and good, and we will get through these challenges as a community. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Chairman McKay. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we go on to the next thing, and that is that we're going to do the um, Kate Hanley Award in just a second, and then we're gonna take a very quick break, but I wanted to let you know, it would just be a quick break, you can go grab another cup of coffee or do a bio break. I um, wanted to let you know that each and every one of you will be entered into a raffle for a coffee certificate, courtesy of our coffee sponsor, Atlantic Realty Today. And I also am remiss because I meant to do a shout out before the chairman came on to the LFI and ELI classes of 2020 because they really pivoted beautifully this year into the virtual space after planning in-person um, presentations and you know how much that is. So they earned the right to call themselves the most resilient class. Oh, I realized I get a mirror on this. The most resilient class ever. So congratulations. And I know many of them are here with us. So now it is time for the Catherine K. Hanley Award for Public Service. 
And this is the 17th year of this award that was instituted to recognize sustained contributions by a public sector employee, employees of nonprofit partners or appointees to a board authority or commission. So I'd like to invite Kevin Greenleaf, who was the recipient in 2018 of this award and a member of the class of, shoot, I didn't write that down, Kevin, your class. 94. You have to tell us. All right, please welcome Kevin Greenleaf for the presentation. Hello, everyone. I am Kevin Greenleaf, I'm chairman of the Workhouse Arts Foundation in Lorton. And we are so thankful for everyone's support, especially that of the Board of Supervisors, the County Executive of Fairfax County staff. Today, as a board member of Leadership Fairfax, I have the distinct honor of introducing Joe Mondoro as the unanimous choice to receive this year's Catherine K. Hanley Award for Public Service. This is the 17th year of this prestigious award to recognize exemplary contributions in public service. And Joe is the very definition of exemplary public service and joins the likes of Secretary Hanley, former chairman of the board, Sharon Bulova, and former county executive, Tony Griffin, in receiving this award, among many others, to include our own Bill Bowie and Kerry Wilson um, with, uh, in the audience. I had the pleasure of working with Joe since he joined the county in 1995, and as he quickly rose through the ranks to eventually become deputy county executive and CFO. Joe's career has been a hallmark of calm and patient leadership in turbulent times. Taking the helm following the medical crisis of his predecessor, assuming responsibility for many additional agencies and program areas following the retirement of another deputy county executive. To today, helping the county financially remain stable and responsive to community needs during the present pandemic. In recognition of today's honor, his colleagues wanted to share their impressions of Joe, and I'll read just a couple. First, Joe grew up in Northern Virginia and has a deep well of knowledge about Fairfax County's history and how it has changed over the decades. He uses this knowledge and innate intelligence to keep the county moving forward. Another, Joe is one of the smartest and most hardworking individuals I've ever known. He has an incredible understanding of how Fairfax County works and that makes him so effective. And finally, Joe always does the right thing, thinks of others and provides wise advice. He is one of the most logical and clear headed thinkers I have ever worked with. So many of us turn to him for guidance and support, particularly during these challenging times. I will say um, from personal experience, one, of the, one thing that these comments left out is Joe's abiding humility. For someone of his intelligence and accomplishments, you'll not find a more humble leader. At one time, Joe considered pitching his county budget life to follow his true Italian passion of being a chef. Thank God for the county he chose to stay. Before moving to Joe, I'd first like to introduce the award's namesake, the Honorable Kate Hanley. Honorable. Thank you, Kevin. Um, you know, in these difficult and un uncharted times, when local governments are faced with unprecedented challenges, the residents of Fairfax County are lucky to have Joe Mondaro as the county CFO. Joe is a public servant in the tradition of Kevin Greenleaf. Joe's also known to those both inside and outside of county government as someone who gets things done. When you contact him, he gets back to you right away. If there's a problem, he solves it quickly. You can take his word to the bank, pun intended. And he's so darn pleasant about it. Thank you, Joe, for being you, for doing what you do, and for being someone we can always count on. Congratulations. There's Joe. Thank you, um, Mrs. Hanley, Chairman Hanley and Kevin um, for those very kind words. I see Brian Hill here as well. We have to socially distance. Yes, yeah, fist bump. There you go. <laughs> That's great. Oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Thank okay. you very much. Congratulations, Joe. Thank you. All right. 
and again, thank you, Kevin and Chairman Hanley, for those very kind words um, and for um, the individual comments, Kevin, that you read. Um, certainly, um, this award um, is um, very important to me, um, given the individuals who have gone before. The, the list of folks who have gotten this award in the past are individuals who I think are um, incredibly impressive in terms of the commitment they have to the county. Um, incredibly important to um, our ability to move forward and a lot of the comments that the chairman made and that Monica made in terms of where we are now and um, uh, where we're going to end up um, are demonstrated by the, the traits and qualities of the individuals who have gotten this award in the past. I think that um, in addition I would just um, really emphasize the fact that our response as the chairman said our response to COVID thus far and um, the challenges that have arisen in the past um, have all been successful because of the team approach to their response. Um, certainly in emergencies, we are all um, familiar with relying on um, folks at the front line like the police department and fire and rescue and the E911 call takers. Um, and they're all important as part of this response. Um, but in addition, um, individuals and groups from across the county um, and throughout the community um, have been instrumental in getting us to where we are and positioning our, us to come out of this um, stronger than ever. Certainly the health department has done just an amazing job um, of responding to the twists and turns and changes um, that come up every day. Um, and, and folks throughout the organization that typically um, have their heads down and do their work um, uh, during the, the easy times, um, not that their jobs are easy, but the easy times are challenged during this time um, in incredible ways. Um, folks dealing with solid waste and wastewater and are, um, are keeping our, our vehicles running. Um, keeping our warehouse stocked with PPE um, has been a, a challenge during this time because um, you need to seek out the PPE, you get the orders done, and then somehow um, the PPE is, is um, uh, taken by somebody else. So I think there's been just a long list of, of staff throughout the organization with our nonprofit partners, with the business community um, that um, speaks to what the chairman was talking about in terms of the um, efforts and, and work that um, has gone on. Um, so again, thank you very much for, for this recognition. Um, it is definitely in the context of, of many, many other people. Um, one, we, we talk about sort of the, the silver lining of, of this, and in many cases there are um, very pale, pale silver linings. Um, one of the things um, to, to Chairman Hanley's comments um, that typically, especially during the recent years in her role um, with the electoral board, when I get a call from her, it's to deal with an issue, whether it's a budget issue or um, a warehouse issue or a facilities issue or an IT issue. Um, but the last couple of times have not been anything like that. The, the time a couple of weeks ago was this call about this award. Um, and then a conversation earlier this week was about additional funding coming to the electoral, electoral board from CARES dollars. So um, very, very, very pale silver lining, but, but much appreciated. Again, thank you very much for this. Um, and I look forward to working with all of you in the coming months. Great. Congratulations, Joe. So well deserved. Okay, we are going to take a very quick intermission and then we are going to come back and our MC extraordinaire, Casey Veach, will join you and have questions for all of the supervisors. So we'll just be gone for a couple minutes and we I'm going to share with you some of our... Um... Talked about Joe winning the award. They were so happy and just, just he has such a good reputation. So Joe, thank you for the service that you've given to our county. This is just a really, I'm really glad that we got to honor you here today. And, and also quick, I'd like to give a shout out to my friend, Tracy Mundy Jenkins, uh, her mom, Sylvia, whom Karen um, talked about in the beginning. Uh, she really was a force of nature, Tracy, you, you know that. I know she was very proud of, of you and, and thank you for your, um, your involvement in LFI and, and uh, thanks for allowing us to recognize your mom's contributions this morning and you know, to LFI and the community. You know, one of my friends was telling me a story recently at the, that he was uh, golfing with Jack Nicklaus. He was in a foursome. And one of the guys in the group um, was, was golfing with him. His name was Steve. And, and Jack Nicklaus looked at Steve and he said, hey, Steve, do you mind if I give you a couple of tips? So Steve said, of course, it's Jack Nicklaus. I'm going to let him give me tips. So the next shot that Steve hit was perfect right down the middle. And he looked at Jack and he said, well, that, that felt kind of funny. And Jack said, let's agree now. That feeling that you had with your old swing, never feel that again. Well, many of us have actually felt and thought things 
that are old thoughts that we should never ever feel before based on these last couple of weeks. And we've exposed um, some old feelings and, and thoughts and we need to make sure that we, these uncomfortable thoughts and feelings that we have now that we need to keep thinking about those and, and, and adopting those. Uh, I think that, that this last couple of weeks has shown us that. I mean, Jesus himself said that a king, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. So I pray that our county, our commonwealth, our country will continue to work together to fix any issues that are hurting people and that we make improvements to ensure that all people um, have the opportunity to thrive. And I know that our elected officials here um, this morning want to do their part. And certainly my privilege to be the, uh, uh, the moderator of the esteemed group this morning. So welcome to the BYOB uh, Zoom edition of Leadership Fairfax. Uh, we uh, have over 350 people registered. I, I know that. So thank you all for being here this morning. My group should be receiving their Uber Eats any, any minute now at their door. So make sure you guys uh, look out for that. Um, now, the way it's going to work is this. We have questions for our supervisors, and we have our, our time maven, who is Ms. Lori Swift. She's at an undisclosed location somewhere in the Northern Virginia area. So what's going to happen is this. We ask the supervisor a question. With 15 seconds left, they will hear the following. 15 seconds. There we go. So that we'll hear Lori saying that. And then when their time is up, they will hear this. Time's up. There we go. So we have a combination of a sound effect and Lori's voice. And of course, if it goes beyond that, our Zoom Operations Center, also known as Big Sister, will mute you and potentially turn off your video feed. So please be ready for that. No pressure for the supervisors. So our first question, we're going to use that. They each have one minute to talk about the following. We, um, we all, of course, need some hope and inspiration for what's been happening these last three months, especially. So each supervisor, I'd like you all to give us something that you've experienced as positive in the last three months, something that's given you hope, something that's given you operation, or something that has touched you in some way. So I have decided to lead off this morning with uh, Supervisor John Faust to give us our one minute of positive, uh, positive vibes here. Thank you, Casey. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind this morning uh, is Joe Mondoro. That's a very positive thing that's happened to the county. He and the county exec have done an amazing job of uh, shepherding us through this, uh, the challenges of the COVID virus. I'm also impressed by all departments in Fairfax County government uh, I believe uh, they've all stepped up. Our healthcare uh, workers across the county, whether they work for the county or private, and I, uh, I believe our nonprofits, businesses, and neighborhood associations. These are unprecedented times, and everybody's doing an amazing job. Communities' uh, reaction with uh, delivering 33 tons of food to our recent stuff the bus uh, efforts, the uh, Cooper Middle School students who's made over 225 uh, masks for our first responders and healthcare workers. Uh, everywhere you look, you see examples of people doing amazing things, uh, things that we never would have expected up. to have to. Thank right. you. Hey, you made it. And, I'll, I, I, and if you all, if the supervisors can see me, I think what I'll do also, John, what we did before, I'll hold my yellow card up for 15 seconds and my red card up when we're done. That might help you guys a little bit. So here we go. Now, um, welcome to the board. We got three new supervisors here today. I know I think there are four total, but uh, boy, welcome to the board. You, you all are something else, but we'll talk, we're now gonna go to Supervisor Rodney Lusk. Thank you very much, Casey. Um, I'll note that I have been um, pleasantly surprised by the support from many businesses uh, within Lee District. So one company approached me um, and asked, is there an area where um, we might be able to help? And I indicated the point that Joe Monduro made is that PPE was extremely hard for the county to access. And um, he says, I have a contact. Uh, I will reach out to them and let's see if they might be able to help. And I ended up um, getting access to <coughs> masks that we were able to share. There were over 8,400 of those masks that we were able to share with groups such as Casa in Action, helping those in the Hispanic community 
who've been so hard hit by this crisis of COVID, 15. access this mask, and then also others um, in the community as well. So I've just um, really appreciated um, all of those in the, in the business community who, who stepped up to, to help uh, with this crisis. Excellent, thank you, Rodney. Um, so now we're gonna go to Supervisor Kathy Smith. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be, uh, be here to talk to you and I'm really excited. My office on Monday was part of a um, food distribution with milk and dairy products for people. And I think when you see the community come together, it's businesses that come together. It is um, our, our Western Fairfax Christian Ministries out here that pulled people together, neighborhood and community services, the volunteer, uh, Centerville volunteer firemen brought their canteen so the volunteers would be able to have snacks and water while we were there. But it wasn't just a food distribution where people had to come. We used the fast train buses and went out to some of our communities to bring food to them. There were teenagers there, there were people from churches there. And that's, that's what makes this such a great place to live and to be because we come together as a community and we help each other and we truly care about each other. And so people making masks, people being together, this work together. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. That's, that's excellent. So now we have Supervisor Dahlia Palchik. Hi, good morning. I hope you can hear me. Dahlia Palchik here. Um, it's been um, a very uh, interesting six months, um, but I absolutely have to say that as difficult as it has been, um, definitely we've seen some of the best in our community. I think some of that was shared. Um, you know, in my team in my office, we started an outreach to individual HOAs and groups that wanted to know how to help and started a food drive helping them collect food um, for groups like Food for Others. And I went on a pickup a couple weeks ago and we showed up, we said, you know what? Not only have we collected hundreds of pounds of food, but one of our neighbors just said he wants to match up to $10,000 um, for all donations given from our community. Um, you know, and so it's just, it's incredible to see everyone coming together uh, that same community came together again um, to have over 200 people who uh, united in silent, you know, protest and learning um, after uh, some of our, our protests had started here in our county. So having grown up here, having been an immigrant Latina, just love to see everything that's coming out um, supporting our community and can't, can't be more thrilled to be part of this board in this county. Thank you, Supervisor Palchik. So now we're going to go to Supervisor Dan Stork. Hey, Casey, how you doing? Doing great, thank you. I, I think the core part of this is not only the food, which everybody's talked about, and I think it has been a crucial difference. Three or four times the volume of food donations that we've ever had before, those have made a huge impact. But I would also say the, the advocacy that we see in our community and the peaceful advocacy that we've seen in our community for justice and, and frankly, the rights of all individuals, Black Lives Do Matter. And I think the community's effort in, to support, we had a march in our community that had almost a thousand people, black, white, brown, uh, you know, all different kinds of people were there to frankly make sure that we honor the fact that we are all Americans, the fact that we're here for a larger purpose. So those peaceful marches in Fairfax County, I think are a great example of Fairfax County at its best. Great, excellent. Thank you, Supervisor Stork. Great, great example there. So now we'll go to Supervisor Pat Herity. If we can find him. Supervisor Smith, is he hiding somewhere? Do we know where he went? <laughs> if we can't find him, we can jump over to Supervisor Walter, Walter Alcorn while we, while we search for, for uh, Supervisor Herity. All right, I'll, I'll fill in for a sec. Uh, thank you, Casey. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I have had similar experience to 
uh, what several of my colleagues already said. One thing I'll just note, you know, early, early in the pandemic when uh, we were really just getting into the stay at home orders and there's a lot of concern about neighbors, we had, uh, uh, we had really a, almost a flood of requests from constituents on how they could help. Uh, you know, people really were going out of their way uh, and asking who needed help. And so we did put up uh, a little exchange uh, on, on our, our office webpage. And it was so nice, you know, one of the things that, uh, one of the groups that was needing help was Meals on Wheels and getting volunteers to, to deliver meals. And uh, it was such a wonderful thing to hear back that, hey, we got enough volunteers, we're good, take us off the list. So uh, anyway, it just really underscores, I think, how, how uh, engaging so many of our residents and businesses are. So thank you, Casey. Hey, thank you, Supervisor Alcorn. So um, hopefully um, Supervisor Smith can track down Supervisor Harity for us at some point. We don't know. We, so, I don't know what happened to Supervisor. We lost him somehow. So um, I think that it was this week for Supervisor Smith to watch him. So I think it's Supervisor <laughs> next week. So um, let's move on. So we're going to go now to our two-minute questions. Our two-minute questions, we're going to start with Supervisor John Faust. So Supervisor Faust, Fairfax County small businesses and nonprofits clearly have been adversely affected by COVID-19. And there was some concern about the amount of time it took to roll out some of the, of the programs. But um, what are some specific, can you talk about the specific programs and actions that the county has taken and maybe talk about, do you see a need to put a group together and talk about best practices or what uh, maybe we can do improvements going forward? Thank you, Casey. Uh, yeah, the, I, I feel the Board of Supervisors has responded uh, very aggressively uh, to the adverse impacts caused by the COVID virus uh, on both our small profit uh, or our small business and our nonprofits. And we have to remember everything we've done has been unprecedented. I mean, there's no, there, there's, there's no guide for how to get through this, uh, but I think we're doing a great job. Uh, and we're trying to supplement what is being done at the federal and state level with the, uh, in particular, the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, we've had three key recovery programs that we've implemented. The first was a relatively small uh, microloan program that uh, made $2.5 million available to small business. Uh, it grossly oversubscribed, uh, but it, uh, we, we did that while we were in the interim. We were putting together a a grant program that we funded at $25 million, uh, setting aside 30% of that 25 million or 7.5 million just for minority uh, women-owned and uh, veteran-owned businesses. Uh, loan, uh, grants of between 10 and $20,000 available for employers of 50 or less employees. Uh, we recently completed the, uh, the application uh, receipt process, over 6,300 applications. Again, grossly over uh, subscribed. Uh, the money will be uh, available over the next several weeks. And the uh, likelihood, in my opinion, is that there will be additional funds, but we have not made that decision and the board will have to make that decision uh, at some point. Uh, then the third program we do is a non-profit uh, sustainability grant program where we've made uh, grants available to the, uh, the nonprofits that are supporting our social <laughs> Uh, safety net, and that's in twenty-five, fifty, and seventy-five thousand dollar amounts. Uh, we've uh, had one hundred and fifty grants, uh, one hundred and ten of them for twenty-five, thirty for fifty, and uh, twelve for seventy-five. Was that the time? Yeah, yeah, that time. Now, real quick, let me ask you, real quick, Supervisor Files. Do you, one of the questions that came up was, do you see a need to do? put a group together of business people and others to uh, talk about what happened here and maybe some things that may kind of anticipate things that may happen in the future? Y yes, uh, and we have that group uh, put together. We uh, have, uh, on a regular basis, we meet as an economic advisory commission with over 70 uh, uh, business and community leaders participating in that process. Our staff's also working with the Economic Development Authority and uh, we uh, put together uh, a plan. We're preparing a post-pandemic recovery framework and action plan. And each supervisor has been asked to identify uh, uh, upwards of 10 or so businesses in his or her district 
uh, to uh, provide input on how we do that. We're trying to ensure that we have a recovery plan in place so that, uh, you know, basically we can lead the nation uh, locally and as a region or county and as a region in uh, the recovery process. Excellent. Thank you for that. That's, that's great. So now we're going to go. Hey, see, this yes. Kathy, Kathy Smith here. I talked to Supervisor Harrity. He got kicked out of the meeting. He's trying to get back in and he's having technical difficulties. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. So um, we will now move to Supervisor Rodney Lusk. Uh, Rodney Lusk, you're going to have two, um, two minutes here. Uh, I know you've asked the county to look at a funding for an emerging tech center and maker facility along the Route 1 quarter, which I think is just fantastic, just a great idea. Can you tell us your ideas and how, how that is uh, progressing? Yeah, so I'll start by saying um, the area that I represent is principally um, occupied by companies that are in the retail and the service-based industries. Not to say that these are bad um, companies or bad industries, the, the difficulty is we don't have a lot of technology present along the historic Richmond Highway corridor. So my thought here is that we're going to have to try to incentivize that. And we've got to look for ways to attract emerging technology to our area. And thinking about um, things like drone technology, sensor technology, looking at the uh, connectivity between the Amazon HQ2 facility and then going south on Richmond Highway down to Fort Belvoir, and what types of linkages can we create uh, for companies to provide uh, services and products. So the idea with the board is that we would um, identify an operator, um, we'd identify a location, and we'd identify a uh, funding source. And uh, I want to thank uh, Rebecca Maudry uh, with the Department of Economic Incentives for helping us kind of work through these areas, and we will be coming back to the board with a recommendation. And the hope here is that we'll have opportunities for our students along the corridor to kind of come into this tech center and actually see um, the development of some of these technologies and then to maybe develop some interest because we'd like to have our residents move into different types of positions. We'd like to have them move into the middle class. These positions will pay higher than some of these service-based positions. And for me personally, I see this as a way to kind of change the trajectory of the lives of those individuals. So I'm uh, very committed to this effort and um, I want to thank the board for their uh, support of uh, the motion that we made and uh, we'll be moving to the next step. So stay tuned. Excellent. Supervisor Lust, thank you. You and I have talked about things like this in the past and, I, and your background on the EDA and, and everything and you know, certainly on the planning commission as well. This is just right up your eye. This is going to be really help. I really believe this is going to be make a big difference on the Route 1 quarter. So thank you for uh, doing that. And thank you, Casey. As well. to go to Supervisor, Supervisor Kathy Smith. Um, now you spent a lot of time on the, on the board. I find this very interesting, uh, Supervisor Smith. You've spent a lot of time reviewing the zoning ordinance. So in two, I want to talk about um, maybe some of the things, kind of unique angle for affordable housing, which you know, I know may not be, might, that might be interesting to look at, but also can we talk about agritourism as well? Because I know my kids used to love to go to Cox Farm. I know about Whitehall Farms. So if you could talk about those two items um, with the zoning ordinance. Thank you, Casey. You know, um, the board started a process a couple of years ago to update our zoning ordinance because it was done in the 70s. And, you know, as we can see, the world is different, how we live is different, our needs are different. And I'm really proud of serving with my colleagues because we are looking at, at changing and making things better for people. So even though we've had the ability for people to do accessory dwelling units in their homes for 37 years, we're look, really looking at how we should change that. Currently, the units, it's limited to two bedrooms and, and two people, but we've also had a restriction that you had to, somebody in the house had to be 55 or older or have a disability. And knowing how difficult it is to be able to afford to live here, this is the time for us to have discussions with the community of how we can provide different ways for people to live. You know, the other side of that is we need to make sure we preserve our neighborhoods. So people are concerned about too many cars parking. So it's a discussion with the community, but I think as a community, we need to be open to doing things differently. And Cox Farms, Whitehall Farms, great places in our community that have done their business. And the state allowed us to do an ordinance about agrotourism 
and really those other uses where you would go do picking or you'd go to events, the pumpkin events. And so it, it's a balance when the board is looking at putting in an ordinance where there really hasn't been something because we want to preserve and protect those businesses. We want to get feedback from the community. Um, so that, that's the balance that, that we're working with because we don't want to hurt the businesses. So as we go forward with the ordinance and get the input and talk to the businesses because 15 Potts Farm to be, to be a, a thriving business as we move forward because it's a great resource to the community. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Supervisor Smith. Uh, and thank you for your work you're doing on that. It's a, an overhaul since the 70s. That's a, that's a lot to look at. No question about it. And sometimes you can just fall asleep reading those things, I know. So that's, that's, that's <laughs> a little that's geeky. Hard. Um, so now we're going to go to another a new board member, Supervisor Dahlia Palchik. So I'll, going along from this, you know, talking about accessory dwelling units, I'd like to ask Supervisor Palchik what innovative strategies and approaches is the Board of Supervisors looking at um, with regard to affordable housing and whether that's converting commercial or just rezoning or things like that. I'd like to hear from Supervisor Palchik on that. Hi, thank you, Casey. Um, yes, no, thank you. This is an issue, um, definitely was my primary issue when running for office, knowing that while we do have uh, a lot of um, great things happening in our county and, and families who are able to access all of the opportunities, um, we do know, especially my district, uh, the average monthly rent is almost $2,000, which requires a household in income of approximately $78,000. So um, this has been a need, uh, and we know especially now, we're seeing more and more families who are vulnerable. Uh, we know that the, the private sector is very interested and has been having, we've had these conversations, especially with our Tyson's partnership members, um, about how we're able to make sure that our working families and those who, you know, we're looking to attract, retain, and, and have as part of our economy um, are able to live here. You know, unfortunately, uh, with the crisis, we did have to delay um, one of our investments, uh, an additional penny uh, toward affordable housing uh, that would have helped provide some additional gap funding needed um, for some of these projects. But um, I know that my board and I, we're all very committed to this. So in addition to, you know, innovations such as what um, Supervisor Smith mentioned of, of taking a new look at our um, at our decades old uh, housing uh, zoning uh, policy, we are looking at some other programs. So these include public private partnerships. Um, I know there are a few projects that, uh, whether in my districts and in others, are starting to really look at what is the map, what is the funding um, that's needed uh, to make more units happen uh, and to happen in a, in a way that uh, is sustainable and can help us provide uh, get closer to, to what the true need is in the county. Um, so in addition to that, uh, I, you know, I think we're open. Uh, things were a little bit delayed with the crisis, but definitely Hi. open to looking at other strategies um, and at not just zoning, but the ability to transform some of our um, vacant or soon to be vacant um, office or other buildings. Great. Thank you, Supervisor Patrick. And welcome, welcome to the board as well. So, uh, now, Supervisor uh, Stork, I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a long-winded question, but you'll understand. So uh, affordable and accessible health care is a major issue, as we know, for people in Fairfax County. This is particularly a challenge now with uh, CV-19, which has disproportionately impacted certainly mm -hmm. seniors and immigrants and persons of color and other vulnerable members of the community, as Supervisor, or as Chairman McKay was, was pointing out. So what has been done to increase health access and screening and long-term, how is uh, Fairfax County helping with access to affordable health care? Well, there's, there's a variety of things that we're, we're doing. And, and the number one thing is that we have to start at the top, which is really the national government and making sure that we continue the, the Affordable Care Act and, and what it's done for us. Um, it's, it's an essential part of health care. And I'm afraid the Trump administration hasn't viewed it that way. Uh, the Supreme Court will make some decisions on that in the next many months. But, but starting with health care coverage for all, that's a core part of it. We then go to the local level and how do we provide that care? Uh, we have some great partners here. Cigna started the conversation, of course. 
Uh, we have Inova, who's been a, a critical part of that. But I would say the most important part of that is our own healthcare uh, department, our own health department. They've done a, a, just an awesome job of coordinating really all the different pieces that have to be coordinated uh, between the, the doctors and nurses and our, uh, our, um, our other folks who are out there in the community organizing and making sure that we have the services to do the testing as well as the follow-up. We have a new contact tracing program that's just getting off the ground and that'll be an essential part of how we not only keep the economy going and, and make sure that we're all being safe, but also to ensure that we don't have any relapses to make sure that we don't uh, go back on up, start up another curve, which is going to create big problems for us. The other point I want to make, though, is it, it is about all of us in this together, totally. And the key part of that is we have some amazing um, other non-traditional, if you will, healthcare workers that have helped to keep us here. And I think of our custodians uh, and, and frankly, keeping those buildings clean and keeping our, our, our environments cleaner. Uh, we have the clerks, the many clerks that to process and support and are the frontline workers of, of frankly making this work. Fine. We have our cops, we have our police officers. Um, it's a long, long list, bus drivers, you name it. We've, we have a great group of people who have made this happen for all of us. Yeah, Supervisor Stark, thank you for pointing those out. There's so many people, you know, you know that there are a lot of frontline workers, we all know, but we forget specifically sometimes where, where they are and what they're doing. So thank you for, for pointing all that out. So now we would uh, want to move to Supervisor Alcorn, which is a very hot topic, but I think something that we, um, you know, all of us in Fairbanks County are very proud of our police force, uh, but we are, every police force can be, um, you know, improved. And, and certainly uh, one of the things that Supervisor Alcorn is working on is um, you're on the board information's, uh, I guess you're the chair of the, of the board's information technology committee. So what role is technology um, can play in the discussion of, of police reform? Well, uh, thank you very much, Casey. Um, it's interesting. I think, I think it's important to step back and realize that the only reason we know about these incidents is because of technology like this. I mean, like the smartphone. Um, and really what, what, this, what we're seeing is an example of a disruptive technology um, that's you know, widely distributed. Just about everybody walking around has a smartphone now. And it, it really has disrupted a, a, a lot of things in, in our society. But what we don't have on the public safety side is disruptive innovation. So that's something, it's interesting, there's no Steve Jobs, there's no Mark Zuckerberg in the public safety realm that's taking this technology and you know, it, it's, it's a different thing. It's not something that an entrepreneur can you know, step in and make a huge difference. So we're continuing in Fairfax County and under the leadership of Supervisor Lust Public Safety Committee uh, to continue to look at technology. I, we made a lot of progress. I mean, I read today that Arlington County is, is now getting to body-worn cameras. Uh, they just funded that. Way to go, Arlington. Uh, you know, we're in the process of, of implementing that here in Fairfax after doing a pilot several years ago. We're also looking at smart holsters. So when a police officer would take their gun out or their taser, the body camera would automatically come on. Um, there, there are a number of technologies that are very interesting, but, but one of the things in the community discussions we've started to have is, okay, what are the innovations that might need to come along with this? Um, you know, and there's some hard questions that, that we're asking ourselves and talking with the community about. Does it make sense, for example, to have an armed police officer show up to every call? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, if somebody, there's a call that comes in and there's, you know, somebody mumbling and talking crazy stuff walking around in the middle of the street. Um, well, maybe we need to look at the model that we have. It's a very old model of we just send fire and rescue or we send police or we send both. Maybe there's a missing piece there to meet the, the needs of the community right now. So uh, I look forward to the continued dialogue that we have, uh, that we're having and undertaking. And, and I think there is gonna be a role for technology in this. Excellent. So um, Supervisor Alcorn, thank you for doing that. And, and I, I have to thank everybody so far for staying within their time limits. I'm, I'm very impressed with the Board of Supervisors, because everybody says politicians can be long-winded, yet you all are adhering to your time. So I think all of us on the phone and on our Zoom call should be very proud of our elected officials for staying within time. So now I'm going to try another part of technology. 
I have in my right hand Supervisor Harity. So we are going to try to see if this works. I have him on speaker. I'm going to ask him his question and we will see if this will um, work out here. So Supervisor Harity, do you want to say hi, everybody? Hello, everybody. And good news, I can't, uh, I can't see the clock, so I don't know how long I'm going to be going. But he also has a meeting coming up, so he has to be off the phone soon anyway. So Supervisor Harity, there have been some changes, I would say, to the composition of the board since you uh, since uh, November, just a slight, and you are the lone Republican on the board. So what is it like being the only Republican on a board of all very nice Democrats? <laughs> well, you know, in some ways, it's, it's kind of hardly a change. I went from uh, three total Republicans to two now to one. Uh, I will tell you, it certainly makes the, uh, the minority caucus meetings a lot easier to arrange. <laughs> Um, but but in, but in all seriousness, the uh, the majority of what we do as a board uh, really isn't partisan, and the vast majority of our votes are unanimous. And it was interesting. I think last year I was I was not the one on the uh, with the most number of nine to one votes being in the uh, being in the one. So, but I've always tried to keep things common sense on focus and, and focus on getting things done for the residents of Fairfax County. And I think I've I've, I've done pretty. Uh, pretty good at that and to get anything done I've got to convince at least five of my colleagues to support an idea which is why I'm fortunate to be at the local level where things really are less part partisan even though that's uh, that's beginning to change the longer I'm on the board it seems to become more and more partisan even at the local level which I think is bad for our residents um, I believe it's important to have balance and no one side has all the answers or all the ideas um, you know, you, you get to a better answer for all of our citizens when many sides of an issue are heard. So in, in many areas, I don't necessarily get what I want, but I do believe I have a positive impact on the final answer. Uh, and, and likely because I'm a, a business guy and a CFO guy, um, you know, I tend to be the business voice and the fiscal, fiscal conservative voice on the board. And I think you need that. And that's had an impact on everything from budgets and, and two rounds of pension reform. So uh, I guess in short, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's about working together. It's with communicating with constituents across the county, regardless of, you know, who they are and, um, and being open to meet with all groups and being in touch with the community. But uh, I, I've kind of gotten used to it, and I see it as an opportunity to bring balance to the board. And, and, and I've always said and believe that open, honest communication gets you to better answers, and that's what I strive for. And did I stay in time or? Did I, go I, I think I think you did. I think you did. The other the other supervisors are, are actually agreeing, or I think they're smiling. I can I, I can I can barely see. I can see a couple of them. But thank you. And sorry you got dropped off there. But thank you very yeah, much for. I, I unfortunately couldn't get back in. I kept trying. Yeah, that's that's a, well. Again, it wasn't the board trying to lock you out. It was just the Zoom. It wasn't anything like that. So don't take it personally because you're the only one. So right, thank you. Thank you for calling in. Okay, so that was, I'm glad that worked out that we got Supervisor Herity. So do we, is, is uh, Karen Cleveland, are you still, can you still hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, Casey. <laughs> do we have um, time for just one more question? I think everybody would appreciate that. We got started a few minutes late mm -hmm. and as long as everybody can stay on, um, you can use your reaction button here and give us a thumbs up if that works for you. Yeah, so I would like to, uh, is, is um, Chairman McKay still on the line? I am. Excellent. So Chairman McKay, do you uh, just, we, I know you talked a, a lot about One Fairfax. Can you just, can we end with this? Can you just um, give us your thought on, because the, the good news is we were way ahead of some of the things, some of the discussions that people are having now. Can you tell us um, how happy you are about the progress we've made to date and how you think it's going to be um, even more important help going forward? Uh, sure. Well, I'm I'm happy with with where we are, but I acknowledge we have still a ways to go. Um, I do think that the the one Fairfax narrative of social and racial justice has percolated uh, through all the hallways of the county government center and into our community groups and nonprofits, and people have embraced this strategy of. Uh, helping uh, make sure we advance all people uh, in the county. But, but I know that we have a ways to go uh, 
uh, still. And frankly, um, I think you've heard from a lot of my colleagues that you know we, we are fortunate to have a board that's focused on the future, uh, not on the past. We don't take anything for granted. Uh, we know that if you want to remain at the top, uh, you never stop making progress. And so this is not a time to rest on our laurels. It's a time to take this national conversation that's having, that we are having, seize it here at a local level. And yes, foundationally, uh, we are ahead of a lot of uh, our peers uh, throughout the country. Uh, but because we have that foundation in place, it is essential that we now have success and that we make things happen. Um, and so it's one thing to have a policy, it's another to see it through to execution. And that's where we are as a county right now. We still have to execute this. And this board is focused like a laser uh, on making sure that happens and, and sustaining our position uh, at the top uh, and as a county government that people across the country can look to as an example. Great. Thank you, Chairman McKay. I really appreciate it. We, as we said, we appreciate your leadership and we appreciate all the members of the board. Uh, just I want to end with this before I introduce our, our Chairman uh, Heidi Bell. For, I really do want to thank all the elected officials for A, taking the time out for being here today and sincerely for your service to our community because we know that you all get so much craziness in your office and people just, half the people seem to hate you half the time and it's, you can't, and in a lot of ways it's a no-win position, but we really do appreciate the fact that you're going to take your time and serve the community and certainly Leadership Fairfax thanks you for being here in this breakfast and giving this form. We had over 350 people registered today. I think we were probably around 280 who got on the call, but um, thank you all so much for doing that. I also would like to thank um, the, the government workers and the police and the fire and rescue and the sheriff's office for all the work and you know our county workers, all of you all, and Supervisor Stork was, was mentioning a lot of the people we just don't think about, but really our, 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 our uh, workers and you know like I said the, the police and fire and rescue and the sheriff's office you all are very much a part of leadership Fairfax but just know that we are you know we also appreciate all the work you all are doing in our community and and I just don't want anybody to forget that and I hope that everybody on this call will at some point today send an email or a text or somebody to one of our elected officials or somebody you know who's working in the government or police or sheriff or fire and rescue just thank them for what they're doing. Because they say, uh, you've heard me say it before, gratitude is the shortest felt of all human emotions. And hopefully we can show gratitude and, and, and keep you know, some of the good things that are happening here in Fairfax County through this. So with that, speaking of, of thanking one of my fellow classmates from the class of 99, who is the current <laughs> board chair of Leadership Fairfax, please welcome to our Zoom call, our chair, Heidi Veltman. Awesome. Thanks, Casey. So in wrapping up, I do want to acknowledge and thank a, a couple people. Um, this has been a great session this morning. So Karen and the team at Leadership Fairfax, awesome job pulling this together. Casey, as always, you did a stellar job leading us through. Um, Chairman McKay and all the supervisors, we really appreciate you carving out this time to be with us this morning. Monica Schmoody and Cigna for being our event sponsor. Couldn't do it without all of you. And then again, a shout out to all of our sponsors and your willingness to pivot and do this virtual format with us. But lastly, I wanna thank all of you for joining. Your time was very much appreciated this morning. And as a reminder, we do still have openings in both the ELI and LFI programs starting in September. So this is a really great time to invest in your STAR employees um, and enroll them in the programs. And lastly, I would just like to wish all of you a happy, healthy, and safe summer. And we look forward to seeing you again in the fall. So take care. Thanks for everything. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for hosting. Stay safe. Thanks, Karen. Karen. Great job, Hi, Karen. Everyone. Thank you for being here. It's great. Thank to you. See you. Bye. Thank you. Nice job, Ella. Excellent job. Thanks, Karen. Great Thanks, Karen, and everybody. Thanks, Thanks, Karen. Fantastic. Bye, everybody.